In this video, I'll present the different types of questions you'll encounter on the ACT reading test. Strange as it may sound, you can think of these types of questions like the people in your life. You probably know someone who's a big picture, what it all means type, and then you might know someone who's really detail-oriented and fixates on facts, like that person who confronts you every two weeks over the dust collecting on the top of your dresser. We'll get into more detail in a sec on these specific types, but I can assure you, the more you know about what kinds of questions to expect and how to decode them, the better off you'll be, just like with people. Identifying the question types is important for two main reasons. The first is that the questions for the reading passages do not follow the order of the passage. The second is that time is always going to be an issue. The majority of the questions that you'll see in this section are going to be either main idea or specific detail questions. Being able to differentiate between these two types of questions is critical to your time management because you'll be able to eliminate many of the wrong answer choices. Main idea questions are prevalent in the reading section. They ask that you identify the main purpose or central thought of the passage, draw inferences and conclusions. Examples of the language used in main idea questions include, the main purpose of the fourth paragraph is to, it is reasonable to infer from the passage that, and which of the following best describes. These are global questions that take global answers. So if one or two of the answers is a detail that is stated in the passage, it is not going to be the answer. On the other hand, Specific detail questions will ask about facts and information explicitly stated in the passage. Here are some examples of the language used in specific detail questions. According to the author, the passage states, and according to the passage. These types of questions require specific detailed answers. So an answer that is general or global or isn't stated in the passage is probably going to be incorrect. Let's look at a specific detail question from a passage about Bobby Jones, the golf prodigy who was a predecessor to Tiger Woods. This passage details Bobby Jones' remarkable career starting with his entry into the U.S. Amateur Championship at age 14 through his retirement. Let's look at question 28, which states, According to the passage, Syringomyelia, F, occurs most often among golfers, G, forced Jones to retire at an early age, H, gradually left Jones incapacitated, or J, involves many needles and injections. Let's look at the second to last paragraph where the term is introduced. It says, Sadly, Jones played his last full round of golf in 1948. He suffered from syringomyelia, a rare spinal disease that degenerates the motor and sensory nerves which can find Jones to a wheelchair. If we go back to our answer choices, F suggests that it occurs most often among golfers. There's nothing in the passage that suggests that this is a disease that afflicts golfers, so we can eliminate that choice. G states that it forced Jones to retire at an early age. While that might be the case, this is a specific detail question, and the passage doesn't explicitly say that he retired early. H states that the disease gradually left Jones incapacitated. Well, the passage says that the disease degenerates the motor and sensory nerves, followed by how it can find Jones to a wheelchair. That is another way of saying that it gradually left Jones incapacitated. And choice J, involves many needles and injections, is a tricky one designed to confuse you by throwing in the word syringe. But you can avoid falling into their trap if you remember that this is a specific detail question that says, according to the passage, meaning that no outside vocabulary is needed. This brings us to our next topic, vocabulary. You may have heard that the ACT doesn't focus on vocabulary, but while that's mostly true, you can expect to see a few words in context questions. For example, all the answer choices may be applicable synonyms for the word in the question, but you need to find the word that best fits the context of the sentence or paragraph. Here's a pro tip for you. The correct word is not usually the primary definition, but generally a secondary definition of the word in the question. Always remember, you're looking for the word that best fits the context of the sentence or paragraph. Let's look at an example from the ACT about 70s teen idol, Sean Cassidy. Now, I know most of you have no idea who that is. That's okay. He was just like any other modern day star, only with feathered bangs and tight satin pants. As it's used in the last paragraph, the word naive most nearly means F, uncomplicated, G, childish, H, unsophisticated, or J, untested. If we go back to the last paragraph, the sentence reads, 
My youthful admiration of Sean Cassidy was naive and shallow, but his talent was real and is standing the test of time. Choice F is uncomplicated. Whether or not her admiration was complicated isn't the message of the paragraph, so that doesn't work. Choice G is childish. That works because it's supported by the first clause of the sentence, where she calls her admiration youthful. But let's make sure that's the best answer. Choice H is unsophisticated, which is the primary definition of the word naive, but doesn't fit in the context of this paragraph, which focuses on the writer's age, so let's cross it out. Choice J is untested, which isn't relevant in the context of this paragraph. Yep, choice G is the best synonym for naive in the given sentence, so that's our answer. Another type of question you will see is concerned with the author's tone, style, and technique. These big picture questions address the author's feelings or how the material is presented. Look for contextual clues that give you a sense of the author's feelings towards the topic of the passage. When you're answering tone questions, it helps to remember what kind of passage you're reading. Prose fiction passages may use words like reflective, contemplative, and nostalgic to describe the tone. Social science passages might use words like skeptical and critical. For style and technique questions, determine how the author sets the tone and presents the thesis using literary devices. These include metaphor, sarcasm, irony, and quotations. Punctuation and word choice are also components of the author's technique. Let's go back to our golf champion, Bobby Jones, for an example. The question states, based on the overall tone of the passage, it can be inferred that the author's opinion of Jones is one of F, admiration and respect, G, aloof observation, H, utter disdain, and J, apathy and remorse. With a quick skim of the passage, you can get a sense of the author's opinion of Jones. He calls him a remarkably honorable gentleman. His word choice shows a positive impression. Followed by, it is difficult to imagine one of today's athletes volunteering to be the assistant manager of a college team. A statement which ends in an exclamation point. Here he's using punctuation to illustrate his sense of awe. Then he quotes Jones as saying, you might as well praise me for not breaking into banks, in response to comments about his noble gesture. Here, he's using a quotation from Jones to further his point. Now, if we return to the answer choices, we can see that F is the only choice that indicates that the author has a very positive attitude towards the golfer, which is very clear from the tone of the passage. Knowing what types of questions you'll find on the ACT reading sections is half the battle. Once you can identify them, just like people, they're a lot easier to deal with. If you keep the question types in mind as you practice doing timed readings, you can avoid any surprises on test day. Now, take those newly minted people skills, I mean, question skills, and practice.